Little Pod of Horrors. Hello and welcome to the Pod People. I'm the Phantom of the Podcast, Matisse Van Rossum. Feed me. I'm Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ben too. What happened to Ben 1? Uh, he was eaten by a, a talking plant. Ah, oh, shit. Yeah. R.I.P., I guess. Wait, does that mean you are the talking plant that ate the first Ben? Uh... I plead the uh, the fifth. I thought you looked a little different when I got home from work. I thought you looked kind of like a giant Venus flytrap wearing glasses. Yeah, feed me. Um, yeah, we are back talking about horror musicals. Uh, sorry for not releasing this episode last week. I got sick and my voice was doing weird unfortunate things that would have been podcast poison but we're we're back and we're we're doing the thing and uh i think we're just going to jump right into it mostly healthy mostly healthy <laughs> yeah i'm uh, a little sick but like not bad enough that my voice i don't think it should crack too much no, we'll I see i think you're fine um yeah so Musicals and horror, two genres that are kind of diametrically opposed in a lot of ways, but there have been a surprising amount of horror musicals. Well, the thing is, you know, they're both definitely looked down on a lot of times as genre films. And, you know, so in that way, I think they both have kind of a kinship in that they have kind of lowbrow B-movie roots. For sure. I, I also think that it's hard to make uh, a truly scary horror musical because characters breaking out into song every few minutes kind of defeats the atmosphere of, of horror, I think. Are you telling me sort Sweeney of the immersion Todd isn't horrifying? Well, we're not going to get into that. <laughs> Actually, actually, Tim no, Burton is an auteur. God, I'm thankful we didn't watch that. No, There's a lot of bad horror musicals. Yeah. Honestly, that and Repo are the two oh, standout. God. I awful forgot ones. about Repo. I was kind of nervous going into this because, to be perfectly honest, I kind of hate musicals. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I just find singing in my movies obnoxious and distracting um i have no tolerance for broadway musicals or anything like that it's just not my jam not to like talk down on those kinds of things like i know a lot of people really love musicals um and you know that's totally fine to each their own but uh, musicals are often such a fucking chore for me to sit through but I think our selection was pretty good. I did not dislike any of these movies. Yeah, I, I think I used to feel the same way as you about musicals, but I've been slowly weaned onto them through, well, first off, through musical comedies. You know, like, I think there's a great tradition of good comedies that are also musicals, whether it's The Producers or The Book of Mormon or even Little Shop of Horrors, you know? Like, I think comedy works so well in musicals that it kind of lures you in. Plus, uh, musicals tend to have a really great sense of style, <coughs> which is something we, I think, honestly, we see through all three of these movies. That For sure. And, watched. and I think you bring up a good point about musicals being tailored towards comedy because all three of these movies are definitely comedies. Yes. Uh, but you brought up Little Shop of Horrors, and that is our first film of the evening, so let's get into that we're of course talking about the 1986 little shop of horrors directed by frank oz and starring rick moranis um yeah. this is the only one of the three that i had seen prior to this yep. it's the only one to be based off of a stage musical too which i um, also have seen 
I don't remember the stage musical very well, but uh, a local theater in my town when I was pretty young uh, put on a performance of that, and and my mom took me to see it. And I think I actually we actually went and rented this movie and watched it in preparation for going to see the musical. Mm. So I think I saw them within a, within a day or two of each other. Yeah. I mean, honest, obviously it depends on the production house you're seeing it from, but I think the stage musical is pretty solid too. A lot of it lends itself to kind of the stage ethos of, you know, not a ton of different sets, kind of low budget because the original off Broadway was based on the 1960 Roger Corman movie, Little Shop of Horrors, yeah, which, which is not a musical, but very much a comedy in a similar spirit. And that was the one he made right after uh, Bucket of Blood and used the same, a lot of the same set, I believe. Yep. I think we talked about and, that. And uh, same screenwriter, if I remember correctly. I haven't seen that one. Um, I want to, though. I, I like Roger Corman. Um, it's very good. Uh it's notable because uh, Jack Nicholson plays the uh, sadistic dentist uh, who, uh, in the newer one, is played by St- Steve, Steve Martin. Martin. That must have been one of Jack Nicholson's first film yeah, roles. Yeah, it was like his breakout role, which is 1960. Pretty cool. So, um, no, it's it's worth watching. It's really funny, um, really solid. But the new one, it has kind of that tradition of the the stage ethos as well as yeah, you know it feels the most like uh a broadway uh musical like even in the way that it's shot and the way that it's set it it sort of feels in a lot of ways like you're sitting in an audience watching it on a stage yeah um and i feel like out of the three it feels like the most like they're breaking out into song yeah, for sure. Um, uh, I I definitely agree. Um, and yeah, directed by Frank Oz, who has a, a long career of uh, puppetry and stuff like that. Um, obviously, he is probably most famous as the voice of Yoda in Star Wars and Miss Piggy in The Muppets. Um, but... There's there's definitely a lot of that knowledge of puppetry on display in this movie, uh, obviously, because the the Audrey to the evil talking plant is uh, is a puppet. And uh, that's some of the the strongest part of this movie is is the the puppet effects. I think they're really, really fucking good. Yeah. Uh, especially with Audrey too, but you even have minor effects that you wouldn't normally think of that work super well. Like one main one that I always think of is the Steve Martin scene where he's in the dentist's office working on someone's mouth and you get like through the inside, the inside. of someone's mouth uh, where you just get big ass teeth puppets yeah, it's kind of gross um but it works really well you know it follows in that jim henson frank oz tradition of a lot of craftsmanship to all that stuff a lot of practicals and in that respect i think it works really well yeah they uh i i read that they they had like three or four different puppets for audrey too throughout its various uh stages of growth and size and uh, at the end of each day that they shot, they had to completely repaint the puppet because the paint would like wear off from it moving so much. And it would take like up to three hours at the end of each day to repaint that puppet, oh which sounds like a fucking nightmare. And they had something like 12 people working on it at a time, which is insane. But I mean, it, the payoff is, is there because it looks fucking great. The, the effects hold up really well, even today um, for a film back in 1986. Uh, I also saw that a lot of the stuff with Audrey too, they they couldn't 
realistically move the puppet fast enough. So they shot a lot of those scenes in uh, 24 frames a second instead of 12. And so all of the human actors had to lip sync their lines in slow motion in order for them to be able to speed the the footage up to make it. Oh, they shot yeah. it in 12? Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, that that's pretty insane actually it turned out really well though it's I mean, no you you couldn't you can't tell like yeah. it's it's seamless it's really really excellent extremely impressive i'm not sure what this film's budget was but it, it's production value especially in uh set design and costume is is pretty spectacular uh i, I mean the the city set is fucking huge like when they do the the Skid Row song at the beginning, like that set is fucking massive. They must have been on a huge soundstage, must have taken forever to put together. So I, I have a lot of respect for that. Yeah. Um, I had forgotten from when I was little how many big name comedy actors of the time are actually in this movie. Yeah, you got most of the Second City troupe. You have like Steve Martin, John Candy, Bill Murray... And Rick Moranis, um, yeah. of course. Um, this is the only film in which Bill Murray and Steve Martin appear together, uh, which is also something that I didn't know, which is cool. Bill Murray's uh, got a bit part, but his scene with Steve Martin is great because Steve Martin's like this masoch- or uh, sadistic dentist who became a dentist because it gives him an excuse to hurt people. And... Bill Murray is like a masochist who is like sexually aroused by people working on his teeth. So he goes into the dentist's office and there's the great scene between the two of them where they're both like getting off from the the interaction, which is really weird and gross and funny. That was probably one of my favorite parts. I think a lot of that was ad-libbed between the two of them as well, which isn't terribly surprising considering their comedic chops. Yeah. Um, No, I think that scene is great. Steve Martin really kind of steals the show whenever he shows up, in my opinion. Oh, for sure. In this movie. I mean, his death scene is really great, too, when he uh, puts the laughing gas on himself and then can't take it off. Oh yeah, he um, ODs on yeah. laughing gas. Yeah, that that great costume design, this weird laughing gas gas mask with the the little balloons on the front of the nose that inflate and stuff. That shit's really fucking awesome. Uh maybe for those who aren't familiar with the story, although I feel like it's a pretty big part of pop culture, it's about a guy who works in a flower shop in a poor part of town. The shop is floundering and about to go out of business, and uh, during a solar eclipse, a mysterious plant appears in a shop in Chinatown, and he buys it and takes it back to the flower shop and puts it on display, and uh, as if by magic, that just brings in a shitload of business everybody coming in to see this strange and bizarre plant but it turns out that this plant doesn't survive off of sunlight and water it has to uh be fed with human blood so uh as it gets bigger and bigger he starts killing people and feeding them to the plant Um, and it starts talking and starts promising him greatness and stuff. And, um, man, the, some of the Audrey two stuff in this movie is, is really great. I can't remember the name of the actor who does its voice. Um, Levi Stubbs. Yes. Levi Stubbs. Um, he's fucking awesome as this, this sassy, shit talking plant yeah well i think one of the strongest parts of the the uh the musical element of this movie is the amount of black talent they use uh for the music between the chorus which is really incredible it's like three like soul singing women and uh audrey too who 
just belts at times. Oh yeah, probably the the most notable vocal performance in the movie. Um, yeah, you you mentioned the the chorus who uh, plays the sort of the traditional role of the of the Greek chorus that you get in uh, old Greek tragedies to who sort of directly addresses the audience and sort of guides the narrative. Um, they're fucking phenomenal how, you know, they always show up and they're always in different outfits and the costume design is great and their singing talent is amazing. Um, really, uh, standouts in the movie for sure. Yeah. And the, the, the style behind them a lot of times kind of is indicative of what's to come. It kind of adds some subtext. I remember at one point they're singing in front of like a giant american flag which is kind of kind of undertoning the the capitalism of you know uh wanting to feed audrey so they can get more customers right and, and like then uh at one point rick moranis's character uh is given an offer by uh, a big company that wants to take uh, like cuttings of Audrey two and sell them as as more Audrey twos, uh, which Rick Moranis realizes eventually was Audrey two's plan all along to spread around the world and conquer it and eat everybody on the planet and take over Earth, which is really cool, and um, which which we see in the uh, the yeah. alternate ending. Yeah, which is the one we saw. Um, the one in theaters, uh, they decided they needed a happy ending. Which is the one that I remember watching as a little kid. Yeah, which is kind of a bummer, because I think the alternate director cut ending that we saw has some of the most amazing puppetry in the whole movie. Oh, yeah. We get all of these shots of multiple giant Audrey twos moving around cities and wreaking havoc and ends with two of them wrapped around the Statue of Liberty. And like you mentioned with the uh, the American flag and the sort of uh, capitalist undertones, but then with like these evil plants taking over, kind of reminded me of... Uh, like invasion of the body snatchers a little bit like those uh cold war fears of like the the united states being infiltrated by uh, a hidden enemy that seems harmless and then you know taking over and to have the at the very end the the two giant audrey twos on the statue of liberty like having overtaken like this one of the biggest symbols of america uh, I thought that was a really nice touch. I, I was, I didn't even know there was an alternate ending to this movie. And when all this stuff was happening, I'm like, I do not remember this <laughs> at all. Yeah, no. Well, that's the thing. It feels like they spent a lot of the budget on it too, which is weird. Yeah, because they have giant puppets, you know, just wreaking havoc on what are obviously miniatures, but like. They're done really Effectively, well. Effectively, so yeah, for sure. You can't really tell that easily a lot of times. They're, you know, destroying bridges, destroying giant buildings, just wreaking complete havoc. Well, because from the, the, the original ending that I remember... Um, Rick Moranis saves Audrey, Audrey One, his love interest, who he names the plant after, uh, saves her from Audrey Two, and they move away from the city and get their little house in the suburbs like they wanted, um, and then we, it like pans down from their window and you see a tiny little Audrey Two growing in the garden, and that, that's the one I remember, but in this one, Audrey... Just just straight up dies, um, which honestly I like better because I find her character kind of insufferable. It's mostly her voice. Yeah, I was going to talk about that a little bit. I think it works in, because it's a very big musical thing. Um, but Well, she's, if... she's the only actor in the movie who is from the the broad the off-broadway musical huh 
She was she was actually in the original cast of the musical, and they got her on for the movie. She's the only one. I think she works for me because it's such a unique take on a character in such a big movie. But I think in any other setting, she would have just been super grating for me. I mean, I think I think she's a good actress, and I her. Her sort of wide-eyed, endlessly innocent character works really well in the context of the movie. I don't have a problem with the character. Her voice is just awful, though. It's just so annoying. It's very, definitely like a high soprano. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, her, her singing voice is fine, but it's her speaking voice that I just can't stand. It's just so fucking obnoxious uh to the point where like i started to dread any of her scenes just because i didn't want to have to listen to her talk too much but you know it it works in the context of the movie i just cannot stand her voice (laughs) (laughs) i think we can just go right into ratings yeah, sure. Do you want to rate it? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think this is a solid movie. Um, it's effective in its horror and its comedy um, in a lot of ways. You know, it's definitely over the top and silly, um, which makes it not the scariest. But I think that's, you know, kind of displaced by the incredible puppetry from Frank Oz and co., um, I think it's really inventive in some of that puppetry. I uh, love the director's cut ending. The uh, original ending is pretty solid, but the director's cut ending is really worth seeking out if you're able to. The music is great. Overall, I would give this a four out of five pods. I think it's really solid. Yeah, um, I, I agree with a lot of that. Um I definitely think it works better as a comedy than as a horror film because it is very funny and you've got all of these comedic legends just chewing up the scenery. Um, Rick Moranis is great. I wish he still acted in things. I really like Rick Moranis. Um, Steve Martin steals the show in his scenes for sure. He's a really, really funny character. Uh, I think... Uh, The horror stuff that works for me is uh, pretty much solely derived from the the puppets and the effects because they look really, really good. And like the design of Audrey 2 is great and kind of gross uh, in a lot of ways, too. And uh, some of the scenes where it eats people are, are pretty, pretty nasty. Um, without being really gory or anything like that. Um, overall, yeah, this is a, a, a fun movie. Um, the the music is good. The songs didn't bother me too much, didn't take me too much out of it, although I do think a lot of them are really long. I think some of the songs could be a little bit shorter, but hey, it's a fucking musical. What can I say? Um, but yeah, I think I'm also going to give it uh, a four out of five pods. Um, a really, really fun, solid film. I prefer the, the director's cut ending for sure. I like that it's a little, a little darker. I, I like that kind of ending in a movie like this where everything is not wrapped up picture perfect with a nice pretty little bow it plays a fun juxtaposition with the the cheeriness of the rest of the movie for sure um so yeah that's a unanimous four out of five pods for little shop of horrors and uh now we're gonna move on to our next film uh billy the kid and the green bay's vampire So I want to preface this one a little bit. Um, I curated the three movies. All three of these are definitely horror musicals, but this one I, you could probably argue is the least horror out of the three. Oh, for sure. Um, but it's I wanted an excuse to talk about this movie because A, Alan Clark, the director, is one of the greatest British directors of all time. 
and never really gets the recognition he deserves. B, like, the movie itself is such an anomaly, and I feel like it needs to be talked about more because it's such a unique, bizarre blend of genres. Yeah, I had never even heard of this movie. I went into it knowing absolutely nothing about it, and it's probably one of the most bizarre films I've ever seen. Yeah, so Alan Clark, he's known for his social realism movies. You know, he has movies like Scum or Made in Britain um, or even Christine where the protagonists are juvenile delinquents or uh, neo-Nazis or heroin addicts, you know, just lowbrow you know, low-class people going through day-to-day life in Britain in the 70s and 80s. Um, This movie came out the same year as Little Shop of Horrors in 86. Um, So this movie came out in 86, but in comparison to those movies, it's such a huge departure from, you know, the movies that are in that social realism vein. But at the same time, it plays off a lot lot of those same themes, albeit in a much, much different way. The uh, story is, uh, so there's this uh, sleazy uh, snooker manager who loses too much money in a card game to the mob. And so to pay them back, he has to set up a really big uh, snooker game between uh, two snooker legends at the time, the uh, near-retired or retired Green Bay's vampire. Who is an actual vampire. Who is an actual vampire. And Billy the Kid, who's an up-and-coming, you know, Western cowboy kind of sort of character. A, a cockney cowboy. Yeah, a cockney which is ca- very, cowboy. Which is very bizarre. I did not expect going into this movie that it would be snooker based. Like I said, I I knew nothing about this movie and I know very, very little about snooker. Um, it's a, a British billiards game played on a larger table than pool and there's a bunch of different colored balls and you get points for bouncing them or something and you have to hit like certain colors in a certain order or something like that yeah it's... i i don't understand it at all i when i was a teenager and i spent one of my summers in holland there was like the world snooker championships going on and i watched some with my dad because he really likes snooker and it's cool to watch, like, especially seeing some of the shots that these, like, really accomplished championship players make. But Jesus Christ, I don't understand it at all. I I don't know how you play yeah, this game. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty bafflingly confusing game. The, the story behind this movie <laughs> is actually somewhat based on a re- real-life snooker rivalry between these two guys, uh, Ray Reardon and Jimmy White. Um, Ray Reardon was, you know, like an aristocratic, uh, highbrow, professional snooker player, while uh, Jimmy White was a young up-and-comer, which kind of reflects in how the Green Bay's vampire is, you know, kind of a, a snooty, posh, aristocratic dude. And all of his fans are, like, wealthy, high-society people, while Billy the Kid's fans are all, like, cockney punks. So it's, like, there, there's sort of, like, a class struggle element to the whole thing. Yeah, um, which I think is really, really effective. They use a lot of very localized British slang at times in this movie. Yeah, and a lot of the um, accents are yeah. very, very thick. I think the the worst times with that are during the songs, which I actually 
I actually really like the songs in this movie. Yeah, They're I think the music is really solid. Probably, and... probably my favorite out of the three that we that we are talking about. But that being said, in a lot of the songs with the the really thick English accents, uh, a lot of the words are just kind of lost. Well, yeah, and they use a lot of slang, like green bays is, I guess, the, like, felt on the table. Oh, yeah, is that what that is? That yeah, makes sense. Yeah, they, they talk about, I think it's green stamps in one song. Yeah, which at the I beginning. Think is, is, that, is that money? Referring to money. Oh, I figured. Um, the mobsters kind of have a unique set of terms for what they do, which is really funny because I was reading about the the production of this movie and apparently one of the big stipulations for funding this movie was it would have to be released internationally and i feel like this is such a british movie through very and much through. so well i think that's part of the reason that i had never heard of it cuz it's it's so specifically obscure yeah, that I can't imagine how this would have been received outside of the UK. Probably better in other parts of Europe than in places like the US. Uh, I can definitely see this movie doing very badly with an American audience. Yeah, I think it's so niche that it would kind of just confuse a lot of Americans at, at the time. But I think it has a lot of really unique qualities that in retrospect are definitely appreciated. Um, I think of like the insane sense of style this movie has. The, the style is really strange i think in a good way all the the sets are like really minimalistic and almost feel like dystopian a little bit yeah you've got yeah, all of these lots like of lots of concrete none of the rooms in any of the scenes have windows it, but you see the ceilings some a lot of times yeah you know, but it gives you closed yeah, it, it the whole thing feels like it's shot in like a series of underground bunkers. Yeah, to me. it almost defies, you know, a sense of space a lot of times too. You go between these rooms with like ceilings that you can see in frame and then you have just giant rooms where it seems like they never end and they go up forever and you have selective spotlights. And, like, the lighting is very unique in a lot of ways. And everything's, yeah, lots of spotlights uh, in a lot of the songs. Like, there'll be spotlights, like, following characters around the set, which makes it feel very much like a stage production. But then you have these long, steady cam shots where you follow the characters. Yeah. And it feels really in the world. And the thing about it is all of this, like, stylistic choice doesn't take me out of it no um, me either it, it it fits the the story that it's telling very well i think yeah it's almost like the sets are constructed in a way to purposely put all of your attention on the characters the sets are not distracting at all alan clark does such a great job with mise en scene too where He'll have, for example, at times when the, the mafia is on stage, they're, they're like set up in like a triangle formation, yeah. like snooker balls almost. Or uh, one of the uh, characters in it is like a journalist who goes in to interview Billy the Kid. And he's in this, like, arcade room with a bunch of diff his friends, I guess. Yeah, that and, was weird. Yeah, and it was, like, long strips of, like, arcade machines almost. Yeah, I, I will admit I didn't quite get what was happening in those scenes. Mm -hmm. I, I think I owe a lot of that to not being able to understand the lyrics in some of the songs. There were definitely certain scenes where I just straight up didn't know what was happening yeah but like it's still stylistic enough to be interesting i also really liked uh 
any of the scenes where the characters were in cars. It was just like the car like lit from the outside on like a totally black background with like some fog or something. Yeah. So it's not like, I mean, it was obvious that the cars were just stationary, but yeah, so it just further enhances like this whole feeling of being underground. Like there's no street lights or anything. It's not like the cars are driving down a road. Once again, feels very much like a stage production in that sense. Yeah. It's like almost- a light, li- like a low budget stage production as opposed to like, Little Shop of Horrors, which feels like a really grand, like, Broadway stage production. Yeah, exactly. And, like, I I think the underground thing is a really good way to put it, because it almost defies traditional location and space in a lot of ways. Um, It's very indoors, even in, like, scenes with, you know, cars and stuff. It's very indoors. It's very, yeah, it's very indoors. Um, And uh, I think it works well. And I think that's the reason why in this movie, especially when they do break into song, it doesn't feel that out of place. Well, because, yeah, this film specifically doesn't really feel like it takes place in our world. So the, the breaking into song doesn't feel as jarring i think because you're sort of in this like weird almost alien dystopian kind of world so yeah it just the style of this movie is definitely it's it's strongest suit by far everything in terms of style i was really digging the set design the costumes the lighting uh the camera work all of that stuff i really liked um, I, I think where it flounders is in the narrative though, for me, especially like the last third of the film or so is this snooker game between yeah, the so, two of them. So they, the, the manager kind of wheels and deals his way into setting up this showdown between the two it's a 17 match snooker showdown which first off 17 matches is a lot of snooker yeah like i i get that you know they play a lot of games because one person can just run the can table, clear the board you know yeah. so you have to but it does prolong what happens for a long time in well, the yeah, third act. I, I like I like all of the setup. I like how he uses this journalist to like pit the two against each other to sort of make them set up the match. He's sort of like pulling the strings where this journalist is like going to each one of them and saying, Oh, the other guy said such and such about you. And then, you know, they'll talk shit about the other guy. And then she goes to the other guy and he talks shit about the other guy back and forth. So it's, so they sort of like trick them into thinking that making the match is their idea. Yeah. I think that was really cleverly done. And I think the fact that you don't quite know uh, what side the the mob boss is going to bet on. Obviously, he's going to try to fix the game however he right. can. Um, so there's kind of a tension there, too, which I think is interesting. What I did think was a bit weird is that, like, the manager who's setting up all of this stuff is, like, Billy the Kid's manager. Like, they're, like, best friends. So... At a certain point in the movie, even though he's doing this to, like, pay off his debts, like, he still wants Billy to win, and he's trying to help him win in any way he can. So I thought that that was a little bit... His motivations were a little bit confusing at times, because in the beginning especially, he comes across as very, like, conniving and sleazy, and then at a certain point sort of flips around and becomes more like righteous and like uh, the well, best I, friend I, I think, the sidekick i think the real turning point was honestly one of my favorite songs in the movie uh i'm the one uh where they kind of go back and forth between the two talking about who made who where you know billy the kid argues that he uh with his, all his skills 
right. made this manager who he was while the manager is like, I scoped you out. You know, if it wasn't for me, you'd just Nobody be would hustling know who you dudes are. Yeah. In, in pool halls and stuff. Um, and that song is really good. And it's weird because that song has such a weird time signature. Like it's do, 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 do. Like it defies any sort of logic, but it works really well. And it's brought up later during the, uh, the snooker right. match itself. Yeah, it has um, a re- it has its refrain. Yeah, I can't say I really understand Snooker super well either, but I will say that the match doesn't bother me all too much. It does go on for a little while, but they do an interesting way of pushing it forward a lot because at a certain point, a couple games in, uh, the vampire uses his mind control powers to make all of the balls invisible for Billy the Kid. So he can't start his round because he doesn't see any balls on the table and he's freaking out. And because he can't play, uh, the ref keeps calling the rounds for the vampire because he, he's not playing. And see, I I will admit I did not pick up on on that that is what was happening the the snooker match is where i really started to lose interest because i just got so lost i i did not realize that the vampire was making the balls invisible to billy the kid i didn't know why billy the kid was freaking out and not doing the the snooker yeah well we should also say that the the bet in this movie is the loser can't play snooker ever again professionally professionally yeah it's uh, high stakes yeah high stakes to say the least and so it ends up being eight zero in uh the vampire's favor um in a uh you know 17 match game so he wins one more he wins it all and of course you know billy the kid comes back and he starts winning rounds after round and it gets neck and neck, and <laughs> there's a great uh, scene. Well, besides the great circular panning shots of all these crowds in the the balcony, um, which I thought was shot incredibly because they're yeah. they're like uh, elevated above the table, yet they do these long rotating panning shots around them, which must have used like a crane i guess um, yeah well like i said the 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 visual style and everything is great like that that never became a problem for me um but yeah man in that last 30 minutes i just lost interest so quick because i was just so lost and is what was happening and i mean honestly that's on me more than anything else that i guess i wasn't paying close enough attention to pick up on what was happening, but it definitely hurt the movie for me by the end. Like I, I was there for like the first two thirds and then the last part is like, I don't understand snooker. All I know is that the vampire is winning and Billy, the kid is losing. That's all I can tell. Well, the thing is, I don't think you honestly have to know the ins and outs of snooker really well to appreciate it because they all pretty much run the table every time. Well, and right. the only time they don't run the table is for dramatic effect for one of them to run the table. Sure. Um. So I, I, I think the particulars don't matter too much. And I think, for me at least, the lengthiness of the snooker scenes is alleviated by that awesome sense of style it has, as well as... There's some really good music in that segment. You have this uh, woman who's kind of sort of a love interest of Billy the Kid, I think. Or is it just the journalist? I can't... She she just belts uh, one of the songs throughout it. I think that was the journalist. I think it was, yeah. I think it was the journalist. But she uh, has a really good song in it. The uh, climactic scene, you know, they're 8 and 8 and... 
Billy the Kid is uh, running the table. He misses a ball. Uh, va- the vampire is running the table. He misses one. So Billy the Kid finishes it out right as he's hitting the last ball in to uh, win the match by like one point. Uh, the vampire freezes the ball midair. Right right above the hole. And then Billy the Kid pulls his six shooter and shoots the ball into the hole. Which I thought was really fucking funny. Yeah, it's incredible, honestly. But then, like, immediately after that, the movie just ends. Yeah. It has a very, very abrupt ending. Uh, I did think that was very funny. I, I like this sort of unexplained element of the supernatural with the vampire. Like, he's just a vampire. Nobody ever really talks about that. And he's got these weird vampiric powers well that's the funny thing because they subvert your expectations a couple times with that when they first introduce him because at first you see him in like a coffin and he's like it's a very like in like a castle it's like yeah. a very dracula yeah. style thing it's he's very dressed in the cloak and he's got these massive fangs yeah and he like gets out of his coffin and then he just shills for a product. Because yeah, it's a commercial. He's shooting a commercial the whole for, like, time. Toothpaste yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. And what I thought was a well, really oh god. What, what I thought was a really funny touch is like he's got these massive like over exaggerated fangs, and then after that scene, he like takes them off, and he still has fangs, but they're like small more normal sized vampire fangs so they had him put on these like ridiculous massive vampire fangs for the commercial well it's really great because uh we see the fangs because he gets up and you know kind of does a maniacal grin at the camera and then right in the middle of it there's that like goofy like glean off of the shiny teeth and then he holds up the toothpaste it's just like i was not expecting no me either i didn't know what was happening in that introduction i was like wow this has taken a really weird turn (laughs) and then to have it be a commercial was really funny uh i i think the the vampire is probably my favorite character i think he's the funniest uh especially when he's getting mad about uh all of the the shit that Billy the Kid is talking and uh, you know calling him like a like a little upstart you know punk. Um, I, that was probably my favorite song. Is uh, the Vampire's first song where he's uh, singing with his wife? I guess. Yeah. Um, I, I thought that was was a really great scene. I also love the scene where they go to his house and upstairs he's got like this black marble snooker table and then under it is just like a glass coffin that has his dead father in it yeah. <laughs> and the reveal on that is is really funny so he's got his dad entombed in this snooker table cuz his dad was the one who taught him to play snooker uh, those, all of those little touches were were really great. Do you want to go ahead and rate this? Yeah, sure. So like I said before, this movie has to be seen to be believed in a lot of ways. It's really bizarre. It's, uh, you know, never have I ever before this seen a Western horror comedy musical snooker movie. Well, yeah, I think... Loosely based on a true story. I think before we rate, we should clarify a little bit like what you were saying that this is very loosely a horror film. Um, We've gone pretty loose with some of our definitions of horror on this show before, but I think this one probably takes the cake in the sense that... Well, I don't know. I mean, I think you have the horror tropes of Dracula in this in a lot of respects. That's that's it though. There's there's no violence, there's no death. Uh just one of the characters is a vampire. That that's about the only horror thing about it. And I mean that's fine. Uh I would very 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 loosely call this a horror film. It's not scary at all. Um but 
It's definitely Sty- horror influenced. Stylistically, though. it is horror influenced for sure. Yeah, and I think you know having the thematics of Dracula as this you know crusty posh snooker aristocrat um, works really well. You know, in terms of the idea of what we know Dracula as, which is a really cool juxtaposition, I think. I think the music is really incredible in this movie. Alan Clark does an amazing job with the style of this movie, as well as kind of taking those (coughs) social realism influences or background and kind of translating it into this movie that's way larger than life. I can understand how the third act drags a little, but I was carried throughout it because of the idiosyncratic style of the movie. Again, I think this movie has to be seen to be believed. I don't think it had a wide American release ever. I know the rights are owned by Lionsgate, which is one of the big reasons why it hasn't gotten like a criterion or anything. If you have a chance to see this movie, definitely seek it out because it's uh, it's definitely one of a kind. Um, I would give this movie a four and a half out of five just because it's so unlike any other movie I've ever seen. And the style is really good. Yeah, I I definitely love the style of this movie a lot. That, you know, in every sense... Um, carries a lot of the film for me. It's really, really well directed. The camera work is great. Um, the the lighting and set design is is interesting and bizarre, but uh, suits the tone of the film. I I think I can say that I would overall recommend it. Um, the music is is pretty damn good and doesn't take you out of the story too much. I will say that I struggled through the third act. I, I mean, obviously, in in movies like this, uh, not that I would call this a, a sports drama, but it's comparable in the sense that the the climax and the the point of the whole movie is like a a match you know so you know obviously the 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 match has to be the the highlight um but for me it was definitely the weakest part of the movie and i found myself getting very bored in in the last 30 minutes but like i said i i would overall recommend it but it's definitely not for everybody it's extremely niche. Um, I, I can see a lot of people struggling with this movie because it doesn't fall into any sort of definable category. Like you said, it's like uh, Western meets horror meets musical meets snooker drama, uh, which, yeah, it's, it's extremely bizarre. Um, I think I'm going to give it a three and a half out of five. Um, overall, a, a very interesting experience. I can't say that it really blew me away, uh, in the manner that I was hoping. So that'll be, uh, an average of four out of five pods for Billy the Kid and the Green Bay's Vampire. Oh, I, one thing I want to talk about before we move on, uh, the screenwriter of this movie... Alan Clark worked with him a lot before this, um, but he was very upset about the kind of over-the-top nature of how the movie turned out. Really? Um, Yeah, he wanted it to be kind of set in a location-based drama, I guess. I think that would have made it a lot worse, Exactly, I totally agree, and I think it's really bizarre, that idea even... Um, but he was in the throes of depression, so maybe that was part of the reason why he shat all over. Well, aren't we all? <laughs> yeah, it, it's such a bizarre movie. Yeah, I think it's, it's honestly, I think it is the over the top, hyper stylized approach that makes this film work at all. I don't know how you would have been able to make uh, a much more serious. Uh, toned down story about uh, a cockney cowboy playing a vampire in snooker like 
what? Yeah. Well, I think this movie more than anything proves that you can make a super idiosyncratic, unique, bizarre film as long as you don't take any half measures. You just got to sell it. You got to make your own style. Oh, yeah. Know? Oh, for sure. I definitely agree with that. Solid well, four out of five. Yeah, solid four out of five. Let's move on. <laughs> Um, our last film for the evening is uh, The Phantom of the Paradise by Brian De Palma, which came out in... Uh, I think it was mid-70s. I want to say 74. Um, don't quote me on that. Oh, yeah, it was 74. I will quote you on that. <laughs> um, but, okay, so Phantom of the Paradise is a loose adaptation of Faust. Um, it's interesting because it plays as both a retelling of Faust as well as being about Faust. Yeah, this movie is Faust meets the Phantom of the Opera meets the picture of Dorian Gray meets the cask of Amontillado. Um, it's got a lot of uh classic literature influences um that all come together surprisingly well for being such a, a mixed bag of influences um but i mean fuck it's brian de palma like one of the greatest filmmakers of all time so if anybody can do it he can i think uh, and, and I think it works. I, I enjoyed this movie quite a bit. Yeah, this movie, you know, <laughs> goes about its story with a really kind of silly tone. You know, it's almost slapstick at times. Oh, yeah. But Brian De Palma definitely has a sense of humor. Oh, yeah, in, definitely. In his filmmaking, for sure. It's uh, um, it's definitely got his, his trademark style, but... Uh, doesn't feel out of place in how over the top it gets and it does get extremely over the top i would classify this as probably my favorite type of musical um what i would call diegetic musicals where the songs are a part of the narrative they are performances in the narrative it's not just the characters uh randomly breaking into song and singing at the camera in that sense it's like something like uh like inside lewin davis which is a movie that i love a lot and for some reason i'm much more forgiving of musicals like this where it's a film or a story about music and it's not a story that could be told without the music, which I feel like is what a lot of musicals are. Even something like Little Shop of Horrors, obviously, originally, it was a film that was not a musical. Yeah. The, the musical aspect is is a, a different interpretation of it, but something like Phantom of the Paradise, just like something like Inside Lewin Davis, the music is a central, necessary aspect of the story. Well, I think diegetic musicals are sometimes the best way to wean people into musicals because like you said they they're very naturalistic in a lot of ways usually when people say they don't like musicals i recommend them like the producers um which is very similar in a lot of ways or uh all that jazz which is autobiographical about making a musical but yeah, I think I think having the excuse of having actual music be a part of the story really lends itself to the musicality of Yeah, of for the sure. Films. Um this is a uh rock opera. Um like you said, uh, a sort of retelling of Faust about a uh, a songwriter who after a uh terrible accident uh sells his soul to an evil music producer so that his music will be performed by uh 
the woman he loves, who he thinks is the only one who can perform his music now that uh, he is no longer able to after his accident. So, Even though he kind of can because he has this like room of synthesizers. Yeah. Uh, well, after his accident, he adopts this... Um, weird uh like bird costume to hide his injuries and uh the evil producer swan gives him this like uh voice box that he can uh speak through but in like a uh you know sort of like a robotic voice but when he's in this room full of synthesizers and the producer like hooks him up to all the right modulators and distortion and stuff, it can make him sing like a, a natural sounding person, which uh, I thought was pretty cool. I, I liked that stuff a lot, actually. I really like that scene where he's he starts singing in this artificial voice and Swan is like at his workstation adjusting all of the knobs and dials and shit and trying to get his voice just perfect. I thought that was a really cool scene. Yeah, I think uh, De Palma has a great sense of sound and uh, that scene really highlights what works with it because I think a lot of that stuff is was really hard to pull off in 74 especially um it, it seems almost effortless in the movie but that's the thing throughout the movie there's such a Brian De Palma sense of style to it um whether it's over the top characters or references to other older movies or even in terms of cinematography with you know use of split screen yeah brian de palma does that really well and there are some really fantastic examples of that in this movie yeah there's a great scene where like the phantom has set up a bomb on uh the stage during a rehearsal to go off to kill uh this group that he hates so they can't sing his music. Um, do you remember what they were called? The um, I don't remember. They're like a Beach Boys knockoff. Uh, well, the funny thing is, is they have uh, in this movie these three guys who play uh, three different bands in the movie. Uh, like the, the first one we see, they're like this sort of uh, doo-wop. 50s doo-wop style group and then we have like the the beach boys group and then later on they're like uh like a kiss knockoff uh i I thought that was really funny all of the different uh musical influences in this movie work really well too uh how they sort of like continually shift the style i really like the scene where swan is trying to figure out who's going to be performing the phantom's music and he's got he's at his big circular desk in like a dark room and it just pans around the desk and he'll hit a button and a light will come on and there will be a different style singer singing and he'll be like no and turn it off and hit the next one and they pick up the next line of the song and it just goes through all of these different styles of music um, I thought that was really clever and really well done. And he ends up landing on this like sort of hair metal style, like hard rock singer who just apparently just can't play a guitar to save his life. <laughs> Well, what I the, he's one of my favorite characters, uh, not only because his name is Beef, um, but also because. Uh, you know, he's got this, like I said, hair metal ty- type, like screaming rock voice when he sings. But then when he talks, he's like uh, a super effeminate uh, gay guy. Uh, and that juxtaposition, like when we first hear his speaking voice, it's absolutely hilarious. Yeah, it's really unexpected. Um, and that's why it works so well. The sense of style, like I was going back to that a second, there's a great use of zooms um, in the movie, especially during that split screen, actually, uh, when, you know, they're setting up that bomb and 
you uh, see in a distance the Phantom is in like the rafters and you get like a punch in on him right as the bomb's going off. Yeah. Um, such a unique style that's uh, very De Palma, um, but it's really nice to see and it works really well for uh, kind of this over the top movie because it's so big. Um, and it, yeah, big is a is a good word to describe this movie. Yeah. Everything is big, from the sets to the performances, uh, to the costume design. It's all very over the top, very bef- uh, befitting of of a rock opera. All of that comes together really, really nicely, really tightly. Um, yeah, I mean, the Phantom doesn't want to write songs. He wants to write a 400-page, you know, Faustian sonata. Yeah, uh, he yeah he he's right. He's spent all of his time writing a cantata that's a, a retelling of Faust, but he won't let just anybody sing it. He uh, sits through auditions with Swan and finds this woman who he thinks is perfect, and he agrees. Uh, okay, I will you know I will finish writing my cantata for you, but only if if Phoenix will sing it. I don't want anybody else to sing it. But then he's uh, he's betrayed by Swan who decides to have somebody else sing it just cause. Yeah, because he feels like just because he's cause a, he's, just cause he's a shithead because he's evil. He he bricks up the the Phantom in in the studio, uh, Cask of Amontillado style. I will say the third act gets a little convoluted. Um, yeah, well, I think they. I think they introduce some things a little bit too late. The, it almost feels tacked on a little bit by the end of it. Like in the third act, it's revealed that uh, much how uh, the the Phantom has made a Faustian bargain with Swan, Swan has also made his own bargain with the devil in exchange for eternal youth and fame and success. Uh, he, you know, sold away his soul and that this uh, videotape of him will age in his stead, you know, much like the picture of Dorian Gray, and that the only way to break that spell is to destroy the tape. Well, uh, in order to sort of spite the Phantom, Swan uh, becomes uh, romantically involved with Phoenix, and uh, the Phantom is, like, watching through a skylight in the rain while they fuck, and in a fit of misery pulls out a knife and stabs himself, but then discovers that he can't die because of the, the bargain he's made. And that as long as Swan is alive, then the the deal will remain intact and that the Phantom can't die. But if anything happens to Swan, then his wound will open and he'll he'll die. But like I said, all of this is revealed in like the last third of the movie. Well, and it, it was also revealed that the love interest uh, made a Faustian bargain. Of some sort. Oh, uh, yeah. She, anybody who gets involved with Swan has to sign this like big evil contract or whatever. It, it gets really confusing in the third act, but uh, the, the whole third act is bombastic to say the least. Um, one of my favorite scenes where uh, Beef dies. Yes. Um, by getting electrocuted when uh, the Phantom, like, chucks a neon lightning bolt from the rafters at him makes it swing down on him and electrocute him um this the way they shoot the electrocution is really cool though it's almost like like a, a strobing s- stop motion kind yeah, of thing stutter effect yeah um, i liked that a lot too because beef dies during this performance it 
creates a lot of publicity, obviously. So uh, Swan decides what better way to create more publicity than to have another performer die on stage. So he concocts this plan that... Uh, during the grand opening of the paradise or whatever, he's going to uh, get married to Phoenix on stage. And right as uh, they say, uh, till death do us part, one of his flunkies who's up in the rafters with a sniper rifle is going to shoot Phoenix and kill her on stage. So the, the Phantom interferes to stop him after destroying the uh, burning the the cursed tape or whatever like that scene is really cool in terms of like the production and how it all looks but it does get really really convoluted and kind of sloppy in the end yeah it goes off the rails but it's so high energy that like you, you just kind of have to roll with it because like it's just chaos well, the yeah, the Phantom destroys the tape and then kills Swan. And then because he kills Swan, then he indirectly kills himself uh, and all of this shit. And then the movie just ends. Yeah. Again, it, just just like <laughs> in Billy the Kid and Green Bay's Vampire, it, uh, it's extremely abrupt. They don't stick around. There's no there's no denouement. They it just uh, it just ends. I will say that the music in this movie is probably my favorite of the three. It's very seventies. Yeah, it's um, it's a lot of seventies rock and roll. But I think it works really well. It's really high energy a lot of the time. I like how they play with a lot of different styles throughout while still kind of having that overarching theme. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a very funny movie too. Uh lots of lots of good laughs um just with stuff like how over the top everybody is like all of the main characters except for phoenix she's pretty downplayed but swan and the phantom and beef are all just like hyper exaggerated stereotypes uh cartoonish and uh and yeah, it's really high energy and really funny. I, I enjoyed it a lot. This was probably my favorite of, of the three movies. I think I like the music in uh, Billy the Kid and the Green Bay's Vampire better. But uh, I mean, considering the era that this is set in and that, you know, all of the all of the song performances are diegetic, this movie... I think the music feels the most natural. It's the most uh, most fitting of the three, and uh, I, I like that a lot. And I think that's probably part of the reason why this is my favorite of the three, and also just because I, I really like everything of Brian De Palma's that I've seen. Yeah, I mean, it's a really solid movie. Like I said before, it goes off the rails a little bit in the third act, but like it's so bombastic and slapsticky that you can't even fault it too much in that respect. Well, no, the the style is obviously uh, very intentional. I won't say it's not corny because it is very corny in a lot of uh, a lot of places. But intentionally, but intentionally so. so. Yeah, it's it's extremely self aware uh, in how over the top it is, and it wears its influences on its sleeve. My one of my favorite little scenes is when phantom is sent to prison and he's a mandatory volunteer to get all of his teeth pulled and replaced with metal teeth. oh yeah so he has metal teeth i thought that was really great too and also uh the scene shortly after that in the beginning uh when he has his accident where he's trying to destroy uh the all of the copies of the the record of his music that Swan is passing off as his own and he trips and falls and gets his head stuck in the the record press machine which is what maims him i thought that was really great apparently uh in in that scene they were using an actual record press and they had put like uh 
like stoppers on the pistons to uh you know keep it from actually closing all the way but they underestimated how powerful it was and they broke while his head was in there and he managed to pull his head out at the last second before he actually had his head crushed Jesus. in in the record press oh, so uh his his screams during that scene are not acting they're genuine because he thought he was a, uh he narrowly avoided having his head crushed Jesus. so yeah that's pretty fucking wild uh. yeah should we go ahead and rate this yeah i think this is a really solid movie um i think honestly this is a really solid set of movies like for for the horror movie genre i think we picked three really good ones here um this one's you know bombastic has such a great de palma sense of style um it's really funny the the faustian stuff works really well i thought the acting was pretty solid too it's very 70s especially swan with his bowl cut and you know big glasses yeah it's very 70s but it works um he looks a lot like elton john yeah 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 and i think ultimately it works as a whole um like i said you know earlier the third act kind of goes a little off the rails but it loses some focus it's so high energy that i can't even complain too much um i would give this movie a solid four out of five uh, yeah, this was definitely my favorite of the three. Um, I would say it's definitely uh, a must-see if you're a De Palma fan. Uh, I think it's a pretty early De Palma, uh, like his second or third film, I think. Um, he did Carrie right after this, which is one of my favorites of his. Definitely a, a, a very fun, high-energy, over-the-top uh rock opera really enjoyable overall good music great performances uh an excellent sense of style like you said um i think i will uh echo you and also give this a four out of five um so yeah that'll be a unanimous four out of five pods for uh the phantom of the paradise All all three of them yeah an average a four out of five for all three i don't know if we've had that before, where all of the movies end no, up with the same rating, we're, uh, pretty a little bit more divided, divided um, on some of these. But I think the all three of these are a pretty good representation of what is really a niche subgenre of horror movies. Yeah, I I will say. Um, as somebody who is generally extremely frustrated by musicals. I enjoyed watching all of these. I I was pleased with the selection, um, and uh, I this this was not as much of a chore as I was expecting it to be. So um, uh, a pleasant surprise all around. Next week. We are going to be coming at you with a review of The Meg. We did go see it already uh, since we're late getting this episode up, Um, but we we won't spoil our feelings on that. Tune in next week to uh, hear us talk about Jason Statham fighting a real big shark, real, real big. If you like the show, be sure to... uh, Take a few seconds out of your day to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get your podcasts. Um, We would love and appreciate if you would uh, take the time to do that. You can follow us on social media, uh, Facebook and Twitter at PodPeoplePod. Uh, If you do follow us on Twitter, then uh, you're not surprised that this episode is a week late uh, because that's where we post most of our updates is on Twitter. So I definitely recommend following us on there. Um, You can check out our Letterboxd page as well, uh, letterboxd.com slash podpeoplepod for a list of all of the films we've talked about on the show and our average ratings and links to those episodes if you haven't heard them. Uh, You can follow me on Twitter at Mr. Van Awesome. And I'm at Mr. Sheets. 
Um, and yeah, I think that will bring us to a close for the evening. If we have any listeners in the UK who want to get in touch with us and explain the rules of snooker um, and tell us why we're stupid Americans for not understanding what was happening in Billy the Kid and Green Bay's Vampire, get at us, I guess. And we'll explain to you the rules of football. (laughs) The real football. (laughs) The real football. (laughs) The football that you play with your hands. (laughs) Um, Yeah, well, I think going off of that, if you're listening from the UK, you might be the only people to be able to see Billy the Kid and the Green Bay's Vampire. So find it. If you're in the UK, you might already be familiar with Billy the Kid and the Green Bay's Vampire, because I sure as shit wasn't. But uh, yeah, that was an interesting experience. Feel free to engage with us on social media. What's your favorite horror musical? Do you hate musicals as much as I do? Uh, If not, tell me why I'm a closed-minded fool for not liking musicals. Or tell me why I'm right and why Les Miserables is overrated. (laughs) It's okay that you don't like musicals. It's not for everyone. I I don't like most westerns, so that's my hot take. Uh, yeah, that is a hot take. So be ready for uh, <laughs> the inevitable horror western. <laughs> oh yeah, well that's coming for sure. I got a few Episode. that I really like. So thank you as always for listening. Stay tuned next week for our review of the Meg. And um, until next time, keep on singing. Keep feeding me. Yeah, keep feeding Ben, too. I'm going to have to figure out where to get all that human meat. Okay, bye. Bye.